Hi, my name is Jessica Kriegel, and I'm back. I was here last year, and you guys somehow invited me back, even though I told you I was going to curse this time. So here we are. Are you guys interested in learning how to get people to give a shit? Yes? OK, great, because I think I have some information for you. The problem today is that people just don't give a shit. Am I right? What is up with these Gen Zers? They're just avocado toasting around. Wait, no, that's millennials, right? What are these people doing? TikToking? OK, well, I don't really know. Let's find out. So I am here today to talk to you about how you can create an experience and a culture within your teams and with your customers where people will actually give a shit. Because if people actually give a shit on your team, it is completely game changing for the results that you will achieve. Now, I used to be one of those people that did not give a shit. But before I didn't give a shit, I did give a shit. And let me tell you about that. So this is a picture of my, oh, there we go. This is a picture of my very first work from home station. I was just out of my MBA program. I got a job at Oracle. I was in heaven. It was like my dream job. I was doing HCM management consulting internally. I was getting paid way more than I expected to get paid, frankly. I got to work from home. And this was way before working from home was cool. And I was so in love with my job and in love with my team that I took a picture of my little desk and I would send it to my dad and my mom and be like, look, I'm working and I'm home. And I was so excited. And I was super engaged. I was one of those employees that is super happy about being on the team, constantly trying to find improvements, volunteering for every extra project. I was working the second I woke up in the morning until the end of the day, but it wasn't tiring me out. I wasn't getting burned out. I was energized by the work. I deeply cared about the things that my manager cared about and the things that her manager cared about. And I was on cloud nine. It was dream job time. How many of you have had a dream job? How many of you are in that dream job now? Keep your hand up if your boss is here. Excellent. <laughs> and then I had, I had the moment. It was one singular moment. In a flash, I went from s loving my job as much as I just described to not giving a shit. And it was because I had my very first performance evaluation. Oh, yeah. I was really expecting to get massive kudos because I was a trainer at the time and when you're a trainer you do those smiley sheets and you get rated on how good you are and I could see everyone's scores and I knew that my scores were top notch compared to the rest of the team so I really thought I'm nailing it performance wise I'm nailing it attitude wise I'm nailing it personal ability wise everyone loves me so this is going to be great I'm going to get raised I'm maybe going to get a promotion maybe be a manager at the ripe old age of 23 years old who knows and I sit down and she says, yeah, Jessica, you're doing a great job, but we're going to give you a two out of three on interpersonal skills. And I was like, excuse me? If I remember my high school math, um, two out of three is 66%. That's basically failing. And I thought you liked me. What do you mean two out of three on interpersonal skills? And she said, you're like one of those millennials. You just need to bake a little bit longer. <laughs> and I don't know what that meant, but I did know that I hated her, and I hated my job, and I was the original quiet quitter, this trend of quiet quitting. There, everyone's late to the party. I did this back in 2009 when I called it going dark because I went from giving a shit to not giving a shit. My reaction was fire. It was, okay, fine. You don't get me. You don't love me. You don't see the value that I bring. I hate you, and I'm no longer going to give any extra effort to this job. I'm out because I had my feelings hurt. And if you notice, I'm a very sensitive person, OK? And there are other sensitive people out there in the workforce. You, of course, I'm sure are not like that. But you might have teammates, team members, who are that sensitive, that you have to be careful with what you say because they can, on a dime, switch on you. And it's hard these days to be a manager, to hold people accountable, especially with those Gen Zers who are like millennials on steroids, am I right? Because they can sometimes not love the idea of being held accountable. So quick poll for everyone in the room. How many of you consider yourselves to be accountable people? Raise your hand. 
Okay, look around. That's like everyone. And how many of you believe that your teams could use a little bit more accountability? Raise your hand. Also everyone. Isn't that interesting? We just happen to have the accountable people in the room, and yet everyone else that's not in the room, they need to be held more accountable. Well, that is not unsurprising, because when I ask this question in every keynote that I do, everyone raises their hand for both. Now, the irony is not lost on me. When we did research on this, we asked people across the nation, how are your teams with accountability? And 87% say that their teams lack accountability. So this feels like a, an epidemic, the lack of accountability epidemic. And it is hard to navigate, and it is especially hard to navigate because we've now got Gen Z folks, they have entered the building. And I am allowed to rip them because I was the millennial that was ripped for all those years. When you were a millennial, you were stereotyped about everything. Well, now the Gen Z years, it's their turn, okay? And after that, it'll be Gen Alpha. But don't pick on Gen Alpha because my daughter's Gen Alpha. Isn't it interesting how we choose which generations we're just going to uh, dig into? Now here's a list of all the generations that are in the workplace right now. You can find yourself, I'm not gonna have to read you this slide, but let's just do a social experiment. When it comes to millennials, what's one word that you would use to describe millennials? Anyone just shout it out. Entitled. What did you say over here? Informed, yes, thanks to AI. Um, so entitled is the number one word that I often hear about millennials, that they're those lazy people who expect to be promoted on day one, and also that they're super tech savvy, maybe not as tech savvy as Gen Z, maybe they are more tech savvy than Gen Z, it depends on the kind of tech you're talking about, and that they're not very loyal to their employers, you gotta work really hard to keep those people. Gen Z, they've got a whole host of stereotypes that are just the same. So here's the challenge. When you think about what word you would use to describe millennials and Gen Zers, and then you actually do the research, which I did when I did my doctoral degree, I did a dissertation research project specifically on generations in the workplace, because I wanted to know what's true and what's not true. Because when I hold a grudge, I hold a grudge for a long time. You're gonna call me a millennial, I need to bake, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to write a book about millennials because of that moment in my history. And so you have to, in order to do this dissertation, you have to do a synthesis of all the research that's come before you in academia. You gotta read all the books that have come before. And you find that there's contradictions in the research in this field in particular. This book says, baby boomers are the volunteer generation. They wanna save the planet. Thank you very much, baby boomers. Round of applause for saving the planet. But wait. Then this book says, no, no, millennials are the volunteer generation. They want to save the planet. Well, thank you, millennials. Let's get a round of applause for millennials. So this book was written by the people that invented the word millennial, so I think these people are right. But then I looked it up, because the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually measures volunteerism. Does anyone want to guess which generation volunteers the most? Yeah, it's Gen X. So both of the books are completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, enthusiasm for Gen X in the room. Okay, well here's what I learned. In doing this dissertation research, the entire industry of what generations want, how to attract and engage and retain millennials and Gen Zers, et cetera, et cetera, it's all a bunch of lies. It's all a bunch of nonsense. In fact, it's stereotyping, right? If I came out here earlier, remember when I said, what's one word you would use to describe millennials? And you all shouted out things and you chuckled. Imagine if I had used a different label. If I'd said, okay, there's blacks, there's whites, there's Asians, there's Hispanics. What's one word you would use to describe the Asians? Come on, participate. Okay, blacks, easier. It's obvious how inappropriate it is. Right? But when we do it with generational labels, it's totally socially acceptable. It's, oh yeah, millennials are this, they're that, good thing, bad thing, doesn't matter. Now, does that mean that we don't stereotype by race? Oh, we do. We do, and it happens a lot. But we've at least figured out that it's not socially acceptable to do it out loud. And we've curtailed some of the behavior and all of that. Raise your hand if you've been in unconscious bias training. 
in all of the training that's gone out, in all of the programs to try and inhibit that. But with generational labels, it's like ageism gone rampant. Let's just stereotype based on age, no problem whatsoever. Now, there's a federal law against discriminating against people over the age of 40. Millennials are still under the age of 40, so you go ahead and discriminate them all you want, but soon you will not be able to anymore. Here's the reality. We're all suffering from a disease, and I have to diagnose all of you with this disease right now. Are you ready? It's MSU. Does anyone know what MSU stands for? Making shit up. <laughs> You're all suffering from a terrible, terrible disease of making shit up in your head about other people based on nothing and then making business decisions based on that made up shit. And it creates a negative experience for the people around you, believe it or not. And when I have a negative experience with someone that I work for, it turns me off. And it also can make me feel like I'm not seen, I'm not heard, I know, I'm a millennial, I like to be seen, so kill me, okay? But we wanted to dig in to understand what actually creates the levels of stress that we're seeing. How do people actually experience the workplace? What happens over time as they join a new workplace? So I partnered with a guy named John Fraze over at Ankara, and we did a study of 50,000 frontline workers in America and asked them, what is your experience? How do you feel about whether or not your management team cares about you? If they're communicating with you, are you engaged? Do you like your job? Are you happy? Are you stressed? And here was the number one insight that came out of that research. We discovered a 10-year curve that when people started at an organization, they are very optimistic, kind of like me when I joined Oracle. I was super optimistic. I mean, I went through all these job interviews. Everyone was super nice. I was offered a job salary that I accepted and was happy with. They told me about how great the culture was. Everything was wonderful. And I came in on fire. I was so excited. And then, for most people in this study, they start to have a couple experiences that deteriorate their optimism, that make them feel that they're not as engaged or not as enthusiastic or not as optimistic. And over time, their experience and the amount that they care about the work that they're doing or the amount that they give a shit about the work that they're doing goes down. And these are actually the numbers. In month one, 72% of people said they're excited about their job, they deeply give a shit, I didn't ask it in that language, but I'm kind of extrapolating from the questions, that they cared about the work that they were doing and they were enthusiastic about it. Within three, at three month mark, it was half people. And at the 12 month mark, it was 37%. So look at that huge nosedive that people take when they join an organization. They start high on you, they wanna give you the benefit of the doubt, but something's happening over the course of that year to make it go down, down, down. Any theories on what makes it go down? Well, it's the experiences that they're having with each other, with their manager, with the systems, with the company, with the town halls, with the emails, with the Slack messages, with all of the experiences that we're having every single day, the text you get from the boss that says, hey, in that moment when you see that text, do you go, <gasps> Or do you go, oh cool, what's going on? And there is a mentality in leadership teams today that there is a dichotomy between people and profitability. That if you wanna be focused on profits, that's gonna come at the expense of your people. And if you wanna be focused on people, that's gonna come at the expense of your profits. Because HR comes over to the CFO and says, oh, I need money for training. We want to make people, we want to give people um, kombucha in the break room. That's going to make them give a shit. That's going to make them happy. And if they're happy, then something, something EX, something, something CX, something, something profit, right? Haven't we all heard that keynote a thousand times? And so then people throw solutions at the talent on their team that have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not they give a shit about the work that they're doing or about how to drive results, which are what you really want. And instead, they're all about just making people happy. So you do things like, we'll put a ping pong table in the lobby. We'll have happy hour on Thursday. Thirsty Thursdays, wet Wednesdays, something Tuesdays, right? Like, as, how do we just get people wasted so that they're happy? 
And then they do these out of the box solutions like this is actually a true one. Shortly after COVID, I had a client that had read a book about the power of sleep and the CEO, it was this coaching company, had 2000 people all working from home, did mandated nap time from two to 3 p.m. every single day for everyone in the company. No one was allowed to be on a Zoom, it was mandated nap time. Let me, spoiler alert, it did not drive results. All right, can you believe it? and they shortly thereafter abandoned the initiative. Then that guy was like squirrel leadership. Don't be squirrel leadership where you get, you read a book, you have an idea and you're like, oh, we're gonna change everything, let's do this. And then you read another book and you're like, that's a great idea, let's change everything, let's do this. Here's the thing, these might make people happy for a temporary amount of time, but they're not actually going to help your people give a shit about the work that you're doing and the mission of the organization so that you can drive results, which ultimately is what we all want. Would you agree on that? So here's the number one solution, shitty solution, that people use to try and get people to care about the work that they're doing. It is the leadership retreat. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> now, I don't hate on leadership retreats. As a keynote speaker, 100% of my revenue comes from leadership retreats. So I'm a huge fan of leadership retreats. However, here's what I've learned about leadership retreats, is you're gonna spend $80,000, you're gonna fly everyone to Napa, you're gonna do a hot air balloon ride, which the boss won't go on, because are you crazy, that's dangerous, right? So then everyone is like, what are we doing? And they get on the hot air balloon, never get on a hot air balloon, are you crazy? Or you go on a go-kart race thing, and then everyone takes their Myers-Briggs. Or no, better yet, your disc profile. Or better yet, your strengths finder. And then you learn what kind of a special snowflake you are, and I learn what kind of a special snowflake I am, and then everyone celebrates their special snowflakeness, and then something, something profit, right? <laughs> that's, what I that's what the CHRO told me, was that if I pay for this leadership retreat, everyone will get along, and something, something profit. But it doesn't really work, does it? In fact, what does work is you get a three-day high where everyone's like, that was so awesome, I love my colleagues. And then you go back to work. And everything is the way that it was, as it always has been. Because creating a culture that drives results and getting people to give a shit is not about making people happy. Culture is not, the goal is not to make people happy. Good culture is when people give a shit. And here's the amazing news for CEOs everywhere. Great companies that get results, that succeed, are ones where people give a shit in that company. This is the win-win between people and profitability. This is the thing, think about the best job you ever had. Did you give a shit? You did. That was your best job ever. You really cared about what you were doing. And do you think your CEO I ask this, I interview CEOs for my podcast all the time, and I ask them all the time, if you could lay off 20% of your company, would, they were like, absolutely, I would do that. No, I'm just kidding. But they do want to do that. I said, if you had to lay off 20% of your people, but the 80% that were left really gave a shit, would you take that deal? And they all would, because they know that there is a ton of talent in their teams right now that are totally checked out. They are quiet quitters, they have gone dark, they are just doing the bare minimum to go by, and why? Is it because we are inherently a lazy race? No, it's because we're totally overwhelmed by everything that's going on out there. Is it hard to be alive right now, or is that just me? I mean, I can't fathom the amount of things that are coming at us right now that we have to adapt to constantly in order to we gotta pivot, we gotta adapt, we gotta change. And now we've got, so we got new generations, we've got AI, we've got this whole work from home battle, we've got, everything is evolving so quickly. And what happens is sometimes when you get so overwhelmed and the fear becomes so high, we shut down. We disconnect because it's so overwhelming. The politics, the culture wars, cancel culture, everyone is so upset, violence, everything is happening. And it's just like, you know what? Did any of you do that news break when COVID happened? We were like, I'm just not gonna look at the news for a while. Was that because you didn't care? Or was that because it was like too much to care about? And that I think is what's happening within our organizations. It's not that these people are bad or they just don't give a shit and they wanna take advantage of companies. It's like there's so much to care about that it's become too much. 
and we it looks like we don't give a shit, but actually we want to give a shit. We just want it to be manageable. So how can you help them give a shit? And here's how. It's the results pyramid. I shared this last year. Raise your hand if you remember this slide. This was the money slide. If you're taking pictures of slides right now, take your phone out, take a picture of this, because this is the slide you're going to want to remember. The results pyramid starts with results. You and everyone else out there in the business world want to achieve results. What do results come from? They come from actions, people doing stuff. Brilliant. That's where most leaders stop. When you focus just on how people are taking action in order to get results, you get stuck in what we call the action trap. And the action trap is the rat race of business. It's activity management. It's constantly checking in. Did you make the sales call? How many calls did you make? Did you track the call in Salesforce? Did you get AI to listen to the call to tell you how you can make the call better? Did you call? All of that is activity, right? And that burns you out, and it burns them out, and it becomes overwhelming. And that's why salespeople hate Salesforce. <laughs> it's not because they hate Salesforce, it's because they hate the activity, the management, ah. But then when they go on vacation and someone's able to take the call for them because something was tracked in Salesforce, they love Salesforce. And it's like, what's going on here? So it's not about the activity. It's about the thing that is driving us to take activity. What drives us to take action? It is the beliefs that we hold about the value of Salesforce or anything else, right? The value that we are providing to this company, the belief about whether or not we're doing good work, if our team is in it with us, if we're contributing to the world in a positive way, if my manager actually sees me and hears me and cares about me. And what drives those beliefs at work? It is the experiences that we have every day. Back to experience. This is going to be an experience thing for years to come. Experiences shape our beliefs, which drive our actions, which get results. If you want to drive people to take the right action so you can get the results on your team, don't focus on action, focus on beliefs. Focus on whether or not they give a shit. And if you focus on beliefs and you shape their beliefs with experiences that make them feel like they give a shit or not, that's how you drive results. Now, I will send you this slide amongst some others if you want as a follow-up. If you text the word equation to 66866, Send that in on your phones right now, and I will send you not just the results pyramid, but some Stanford research that we did that validates that that actually works. We looked at 243 companies with Stanford and looked at what wins. What wins is companies that have a culture that is able to adapt. How do you adapt? You shift beliefs. Not focusing on activity, you shift beliefs within people in the hearts and minds of your employees by creating intentional experiences. So here is the crash course in how to do this so that you can go home tomorrow or go home at the end of the week and you will be able to implement this for fun and for free and make a real difference so that your teams care about you. So step one, get clear on the results you're trying to achieve, the actions that will be necessary for that, but more importantly, beliefs that your team needs to hold in order to drive those results through the actions that you want them to take. Then you, once you figure out the belief that's missing or the belief you want, you activate that with experiences, and I'll sh share with you how in a minute. Then you accelerate with positive accountability, which is accountability that doesn't suck. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And then you assess to optimize. So step one, think of a result that you have for yourself that you want to achieve for you or for your team. Everyone got one? Now think about on your team, what commonly held beliefs does your team currently hold that are maybe getting in the way of achieving that result? And then ask yourself even more powerful, what do you want those beliefs to be? If you can answer that question and then say it out loud with your team, you can start to activate experiences that will move you from whatever the beliefs were on the left to what the beliefs need to be on the right. So how do you activate that with real experiences? There are three experiences that you can start with that are really easy, and they are number one, storytelling. The stories you tell are powerful. Number two, recognition. Notice when someone is living that belief and recognize it. And number three is feedback. You have, sometimes you have to have the hard conversation. But instead of telling someone, you're just like one of those millennials, you need to bake a little bit longer, which is ineffective, okay? You could say, I noticed that you did action. Here's how that is a great example of living the belief we'd like to see, which is belief. Here's how you could have lived that belief a little bit more. 
giving feedback in a way that ties to the beliefs you're trying to nurture actually works, and it doesn't become about something's wrong with you. It becomes about the beliefs that we share and we're trying to nurture. Now, here's a real life example. This was a medical center that we were working with in Boston, and we were hired by the director of the emergency department. She was having the hardest time getting people to fill out the next of kin information for incoming patients when they come into the emergency department. That was the result she wanted to achieve. Get people to collect next of kin information for incoming ER patients. And here was the problem. They were only gathering at 42% of the time, less than half. Now, she was stuck in the action trap before we showed up. She was trying to solve this problem. How many of you have data entry issues on your team somewhere where you're trying to get people to fill out something a form and they're not doing it, right? So everyone has this problem. Put you in this story. Now you may have been stuck in the action trap. Oh, I know, we'll train people on it. We'll get people in a room and we'll look at the form together and we'll talk about the form and we'll say, and then you click next and then you fill out this full piece of question and everyone hates those trainings and it feels super annoying. So she did that training. She also tried simplifying the form. How many of you have tried simplifying a form to get people to fill it out more often? Uh-huh, I'm looking at you action trappers. And she tried translating the form. All this stuff is activity focused. Fill out the form, fill out the form, fill out the form. It doesn't work because the belief that people had about that form and that your people probably have about your form is that that's a waste of my time. I don't believe that that form is going to help me and so I don't want to fill it out. Training them on the form isn't gonna change the belief. So she realized the experience that they had with all of this training was nag, nag, nag. They were so irritated with her. So she said, all right, we got to change the belief about the form. And we helped her identify two stories that she could tell that would change their belief. And these were true stories. One was a woman, she came into the hospital. They did not gather her next of kin information. She fell unconscious. They treated her according to protocol, but she died. And they later found out that if they had known about a previous condition, they might have been able to save her. Second patient, same hospital, different time. He came in, they did gather his next of kin information. He fell unconscious, they called the daughter, the daughter informed them about some medicine that he was on, and they saved his life. She told those two stories for three weeks, and what do you think the belief about the form became? became? Yeah, that this form saves lives. And so this is an important form, it's not a waste of my time. And they started filling out the form. And in fact, in only three weeks, she was gathering the form 97% of the time. That is the power of focusing on beliefs and not actions, not activity, to get people to give a shit. These people started giving a shit because you spoke to their humanity instead of their activity. And so that's the question you need to ask yourself is what experiences can you create to help shift those beliefs? Storytelling, recognition, and feedback. Those are the three most powerful. So then you need to accelerate with positive accountability because you can't get any of this to happen if people don't take accountability for the work that needs to be done. So if you want to help people take accountability, you have to avoid the action trap and coach to beliefs. That means we have to de-weaponize accountability. Accountability is avoided by people and managers alike because it's the way people think about accountability is the way the di dictionary defines it, which is, oh, who's going to report to me for this? Who's at fault for this? Who's to blame here? Who's answerable for this mistake? 35 years ago, the authors of the Oz Principle, the people who started our company, redefined accountability to be a personal choice to focus on what you can control to take the steps necessary to drive key results. The key there is focusing on what you can control. When your people are overwhelmed by all of the changes, the regulation, the AI, the generations, the culture wars, everything, the, you know, the executive team, all of that, if you just get them to focus on what they can control, it makes the noise a lot quieter and a lot easier to manage. So how do you do that? There's two belief systems. If you are below the line, you are not taking accountability. If you're above the line, you are. So below the line thinking is, well, just wait and see. That's not my job. That's Bob's job. I have nothing to do with that. I have no control over that. You know, I'm going to send the email to cover my tail right now so that everyone knows that I had nothing to do with that. How many of you received that email? How many of you have sent that email? I've sent that email. It's okay to go below the line sometimes. We all go below the line. My daughter, <laughs> the other day, 
was playing a game on her tablet in the back of my car and I went over a speed bump and she yelled at me for making her lose. That is below the line behavior. It is a natural tendency as people to want to blame someone else for the problems in the world. But we don't want to play the blame game. We want to be above the line. So how do you get above the line? Four simple steps. See it, own it, solve it, do it. See it, own it, solve it, do it are the four steps to make a personal choice, to focus on what you can control, to take the steps necessary to drive key results. Now, as a leader, you need to take these four steps. But there's also a tool that you can use to help people walk up those steps. And it's four question framework. You ready? If you're taking notes, write this down. The first question is for see it. You want to help people see it. So you want to say to your team, what's going on? Write that down. Very, very advanced work here. What's going on? And then they'll tell you what's going on. And that is them seeing it, right? So now you want to get them to own it. The second question, what about that can you control? They've told you what's going on. They've complained about their colleagues and their peers and the new rule and the new system and what's broken. And now you've said, what about that can you control? And you get them to focus on what they can control. Third question for solve it. Well, what else could you try? Keeping them focused on what they can control, what else could you try? And the fourth question is do it. What are you going to do by when? You ask those four questions and you will watch your team start to give a shit. They come in, they're all upset, blah, 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 and you say, what's going on? What about that can you control? What else could you try? What are you going to do by when? That is the simple four-part framework question to get people to give a shit to get them to focus on what they can control, to see it, own it, solve it, do it. And then finally, you assess to optimize. And this is the measurement part that I know all of you love so much. It's so hard to measure <laughs> culture and employee engagement. If people give a shit, how do you do it? And you know, you've got your EMPS score, and you've got your employee engagement scores, and you've got your focus groups, and everyone's favorite word cloud, right? You ask a bunch of questions and create a word cloud. And it's like innovation, change fast pace. And then they're like, that's your culture. But the real answer is when you drive a culture that gets results, where you focus on what actions get results, what beliefs drive those actions, what experiences will drive those beliefs, then your results equal the culture that you get. You're either getting the results that you deserve or you're not. And that will change everything and your people will actually start giving a shit. Now I'm over my time, but I'm gonna give you one hack to get people to care. I'm in a tech conference, so we have to have the word hack in here, right? That is intentionally obnoxious. Please don't think that I'm into that kind of language, okay? The one hack to get people to care is that you care about them. It's not rocket science. People do not care when they don't feel cared for. And the hardest job in corporate America today is managers. There's this new trend called conscious unbossing where Gen Zers are saying, I don't want to be a manager because they know how hard it is to live up to the expectations. Your job is to actually care. You are not incentivized to care based on quarterly stock price. You're not incentivized to care based on the pressures from the investors, the board, and the CEO to drive results. But you as a person need to care about the people on your team in order to get them to care. That is the one way to get the fast track to get people to give a shit is to give a shit about them. Thank you.